In Final Destination, those who escaped fatal accidents are now in a race against death to find the signs and avoid the peril before it arrives again. The third film contains many references to the iconic tragedy that kicked off the series, Flight 180. The roller coaster that crashes in the third movie is called Devil's Flight, a reference to Alex seeing a luggage vehicle with the devil's number before boarding his flight in the original. Before getting on the ride, Wendy and Kevin even line up in row 6. Ashley and Ashlyn go to Phoenix Tanning Salon, whose phone number is listed as 570-555-0180. And when Wendy and Kevin are on the way to the fast food drive through there's a near accident with a truck from Penn State Towing and Recovery, whose phone number after the area code is also 555-0180. Later on, Ian McKinley operated a forklift, and in one close-up we see that it's Unit 081, the mirror image of 180. At the end, Wendy boards Subway Train 081 and later sees it in the mirror as 180, just like how we saw the backside of the sign of Cafe Miro 81, reading as the number 180 during the conclusion of the original. To learn all of the hidden secrets of Final Destination 3, including the huge conspiracy regarding the subway scene at the end, stick around to the end of this video. Welcome to Things You Missed. This one has a roller coaster, and that's very exciting for me, so I want to hurry up and get to that. But for the third installment, the series was handed back over to James Wong with a G, who directed the first one. I'd say he immediately got the series back on track. There's irony in that sentence, I know. Let's get into the Things You Missed. The opening credits bring back many of the themes established that I've discussed in my episodes on the other movies. We see a fortune teller, representing the idea of psychic premonitions, and she has tarot cards for hope, fates, the devil, and death. We also see a painting of the devil, and I already mentioned the name of the coaster. The second movie contained a lot of symbols of luck, chance, and fate, all being linked. And in this one, we're shown a spinning wheel and a pinball game, both examples of carnival games, games of chance. The pinball game has holes labeled luck, fate, and death, respectively. Another mural depicts the Electric Sisters, defying death in twin electric chairs. The last two survivors in this movie end up being Wendy and her sister, Julie. There are a lot of pairs in this movie in general. We start off with the two couples, Ashley and Ashlyn are a pair. We've got a pair of token goth characters characters, MCR and Misery Business, MCR's real name is Ian McKinley, which pairs with the name of the town, Devil's Flight seats in pairs, and there's also a pair of train-related accidents, a roller coaster train and a subway train. That roller coaster is Devil's Flight, which was filmed on Playland Vancouver's Corkscrew, whose sign makes a cameo right here. I find it hilarious that the coaster that they die on is a Vacoma coaster in North America, because the manufacturer of Vacoma doesn't have a great reputation on this continent. They're the ones who do all the boomerang coasters and have made some infamously rough suspended looping coasters, or SLCs. Vacoma SLCs, a horror of a word in the coaster community. And one of the things I learned is how horrible the Vacoma SLCs apparently are. This has been a step-by-step -step guide to riding Vacoma SLCs. As you can see, we only got to step number five because everyone is dead. Devil's Flight is not an SLC though. It's a model called Corkscrew with Bayern Curve. Not particularly exciting, so for the movie more elements were added with CGI. Since we don't have an actual roller coaster that has a 360 degree loop, we're recreating on a stage. This made it look a lot less like a Vacoma and more like an aerodynamics looping coaster. In particular, it looks a lot like Viper at Six Flags Magic Mountain, but the theming also reminds me of a different looping coaster by Aerodynamics, Demon at Six Flags Great America and California's Great America, which happens to be my first inverting roller coaster. Final Destination 3 introduced a new concept where the signs about each character's death could be derived from the last photo that that person appeared in. When we first meet the protagonist, Wendy, she's taking pictures for her school's yearbook as her friends ride the freefall ride High Dive. But when she reviews the snapshot, the letter V is off, making the text say High Die, which is still a better title than Hellraiser 7. The next line also foreshadows what's about to go down. It was intense, man. To feel how that would be just crash and burn like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe for you, but our lives are actually going somewhere. Wendy's boyfriend also suggests that eating junk food before going on Devil's Flight might kill him. To this point, the opening disasters of both movies took place on May 13th. We never do see the exact date of the roller coaster accident, but I do think it makes sense that it's also on May 13th because they're at the amusement park as part of their school's grad night, an event that would typically take place in mid-May. At the midway, Wendy photographs her classmate Lewis trying a test of strength, but he's a little too strong and knocks the head clean off. This is a sign of how death would get to him during a different test of strength in his football team's weight room, where his head ends up being crushed by a pair of weights. Then our characters head for Devil's Flight. What's wrong? 
I was having that feeling like deja vu, you know? No, Wendy, you got the wrong Vacoma coaster. This is Devil's Flight. The voice of the titular devil is the voice of the coroner from the first two movies, William Bloodworth. I did a whole video explaining why he might be here, so check that one out if you're interested. In line, the school's super, super senior, Frankie, is seen with a mud flap girl necklace, an item commonly associated with truckers, which foreshadows his eventual death by a runaway truck. At the end of the line, Jason and Kevin both want the front row, so a coin flip ends up deciding for them, once again tying the idea of fate to luck and chance. So they all get on the ride. And who comes off a coaster looking like that? The harnesses come down, and it's clear that Lewis is a coaster enthusiast. What's up, man? I'm good. We call that stapling. And almost nothing ruins a great ride more than being stapled to your stapling. There would be more signs, coincidences too uncanny to be coincidences, Easter eggs, and more after Devil's Flight departed from the station. Here you go. Yeah. Let's do it, baby. Woo! We have to get off the In Final Destination 2, I pointed out how the leaked transmission fluid kind of looked like blood, and a similar image is used here when the hydraulics get ruptured, giving the appearance of dripping blood. Before the train departs, this happens. There you do, uh, flash me them sweet, sweet titties when we go through the loop. Frankie, not only is that highly inappropriate, but do you see these over-the-shoulder restraints? How would they do that? As the ride ascends the lift hill, you can spot a nearby topspin ride called Hell's Gate, another one of the many demon references I've pointed out in this franchise. Jay and Carrie are on the first car that derails. Lewis flies out of his harness, and MCR and Misery Business are dropped from the top of the loop where the train is stuck. I mentioned the comparison to Demon earlier. This part may be inspired by an incident that occurred on Demon in 1998, where the train got stuck on top of one of the ride's two vertical loops and had to be evacuated by the fire department. Nobody died during this incident, but it still gave birth to an urban legend about a kid who supposedly didn't meet the height requirement and fell to his death when it got stuck. Which, growing up in Chicagoland and going to this park as a kid, I believed for several years. When Wendy comes out of the vision, she freaks out and causes seven people, including herself, to get off the ride. Seven and thirteen come up a lot, the lucky and unlucky numbers, and seven was the same number of survivors from Flight 180. In Wendy's room, there's a picture of seven stick figures holding hands. Looks like it belongs in the movie Us. Sometime after the accident, Wendy clears out her locker. Her locker number is D73, a sign about the next pair of deaths that would occur when Ashley and Ashlyn turn up the thermostat in the tanning salon to 73 degrees, causing the machines to overheat and malfunction. In the last movie, I mentioned how Evan Lewis's Pontiac Firebird was one of the signals of the apartment fire that led to his fate. A phoenix is a mythological bird said to die in a burst of flames, and then its successor is born from the ashes. Ashley and Ash Lynn are both names that can be shortened to Ash. When referred to in plural, they are the ashes, and they both die in flames at the Phoenix Tanning Salon. Ashlyn forgets her iPod, so they listen to one of the CDs available at the salon, so Ashley picks out Have a Nice Decade Volume 6. There's the devil's number again. The song they listen to is Love Roller Coaster. Get it? Because they're supposed to die on a roller coaster? So clever. But like Demon, this song has its own ominous urban legend attached to it. The story goes that the scream heard during the instrumental is actually the scream of a woman being murdered. Other versions of the legend say that it's actually audio of her falling off of a roller coaster. While Ashley and Ashlyn are getting some color for their funeral, Wendy misses a few signs in her room, like a sticky note with writing on it that says, Books to Die For. There's also a monkey doll that's hanging from the dresser in a similar way to how MCR and Misery Business held onto the coaster for dear life in her vision. She notices the photo of Ash and Ash, and the lens flare makes it look as if they're burning in a fire, so she tries to call and warn them. Hey, Ashley, it's Wendy. Psych. Leave a message. Ha! <laughs> Got <he. laughs> At their funeral, the same exact music from the Flight 180 memorial plays. It's called 100 Grand by Pete Atherton. I believe it was made specifically for the movie. After the ceremony, Wendy pulls out a photo of regular Abraham Lincoln. But basically, Wendy says she believes her photos from the night of the accident will contain signs just as these photos taken before historical disasters seem to. I know the whole images that precede unfortunate events has become a meme at this point, but I can assure you that she did not print out these photos for meme purposes. They go to a fast food joint called Andy's to talk about it some more and try to decipher Frankie's picture. Hey, SpongeBob lives underwater. It's so sad that you know that. What? Everyone knows that. It's right in the theme song. Who lives in a 
pineapple under the sea. Thank you so much, Mr. Krabs. Oh, you're a lifesaver. Go see Patrick. While they're analyzing the picture, a heist pale ale truck passes behind them. Those of you who saw my FD2 episode will remember the drinking heist pale ale truck driver during Kimberly's premonition of the accident, a brand named after stunt coordinator Freddie Heiss. We don't know if this driver survived the real version of the pileup, but I like to think it's the same guy. This truck nearly gets Wendy and Kevin killed when it blocks them in before the next accident. Wendy first suspects something is wrong when the order screen glitches and the word control disappears. It's essentially telling Wendy that she's losing control of the situation. Because as we know, I mean you know, I'm such a control freak. Like, the real fear with these rides comes from the feeling of having no control. I'm usually such a control freak. Sense of having no control. Well, it's nice to see that things haven't made you any less of a control freak. Then, the car radio starts playing Turn Around, Look at Me, originally by Glenn Campbell. There is someone walking behind me. A clue that the danger is going to come from behind them. The first pair of deaths came during the song Love Roller Coaster, and this one would have a coaster reference as well. The runaway truck that would eventually take out Frankie is from Rolling Thunder Moving in Storage. Rolling Thunder is a fairly common roller coaster name, but the biggest Rolling Thunder was the one at Six Flags Great Adventure. In 1981, a park employee who failed to secure the safety bar fell to his death during a test run. The truck barrels towards the Andes drive through after it's left unattended and rolls down a big hill, converting potential energy into kinetic energy like a roller coaster. A roller coaster is just elemental physics, a conversion of potential energy to kinetic energy. The truck also features blue, white, and red stripes, the colors of the French flag, that are seen in stripes on the Voulet Flight 180 aircraft, the bus that struck Terry Cheney, and the train that ended Billy Hitchcock. With just over half of the Devil's Flight survivors remaining, Wendy and Kevin would try to decipher the rest of the photos, and in them we can find even more things you missed. As they review the remaining photos from the night of the accident, Wendy and Kevin look for any potential clues about the next death. Wendy had already seen Jason's photo, where it looks like his head is about to be struck by a roller coaster. I've got a similar photo from 2017, so if anyone knows how I'm gonna die, please get in contact. She also found Frankie's picture, where his head looks like it could be hit by a spinning fan blade that looks similar to the motor that took him out not long ago. They figure that the next victim will be Lewis, but they struggle to determine the cause of death. They eventually decide that the swirling dervish guy could represent Lewis's football team, and the guy flexing his muscles might be a side that the accident occurs in the weight room. They fail to consider how the Sultan's scimitars might play into the equation. However, when they get there, they do discover a pair of swords, along with the motivational text, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. A call back to Kevin's line before going on Devil's Flight. Before riding Devil's Flight, yeah, that might kill me. No! What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, man. <laughs> There's also a callback to the first movie. You may remember during Todd's accident, there was nearly a moment where he could have been electrocuted when he plugs in the radio just before the leaked water reached his feet. This time, the leak comes from the water fountain, and the radio is a boombox. Instead of playing Rocky Mountain High, the song of choice is appropriately titled Killing Time by Head Planet Earth. If Final Destination 3 was made today, maybe they would have just done a cover of Rocky Mountain High called Rocky Mountain Construction. This seems like as good a time as any to bring up the constant use of water as part of Death's design. Almost all of the deaths in the last two movies had water or liquid involved in some way, and we see it again here. The leaked hydraulic fluid on the ride, the dripping beverage at the tanning salon, this water fountain at the gym, and the spilled all-purpose glass cleaner that the forklift slipped on at the hardware store. After being unable to save Lewis, they go back to the car, and they're now just wearing Sultan's merch? Sure, they just saw a guy's head explode, but who could resist hitting up the gift shop on the way out. I mean, I guess there is a valid reason since their clothes got spattered in Lewis's guts, but it still seems kind of funny. Then they have this moment together. Please do not smash your best friend's girl a week after his death, my dude. Okay, good. They leave. Another running gag that I brought up when covering the first two Final Destinations was that many of the characters were named after classic horror movie icons. This time we had many more. Wendy and Julie Christensen were named after Benjamin Christensen, Kevin Fisher after Terrence Fisher, Jason Wise, perhaps named after Robert Wise, who made the original The Haunting, Carrie Dreyer after Carl Theodore Dreyer, she may also be related to Blake Dreyer from Flight 180, Louis Romero after George A. Romero, Ashley Freund after Carl Freund, Ashlyn Halperin after Victor Halperin, and the two cops, Clark and Polanski, who are named after Bob Clark and Roman Polanski. There's also a security guy named Bloodworth, a reference to the coroner from the previous two movies, William Bloodworth. Ian and Aaron also have nicknames for each other, Zip and Pip. Zip, 
It's Pip. Have you cut those plywood orders yet? Which are the names of these two in the 1932 horror classic, Freaks. Kind of a self-aware joke about them being the gothic pair. There's also a new theme introduced in this one, where there's a common nomenclature for all of the exits on the subway. But I'll get to that a little bit later on in the video. Next up on Death's Hit List is our good friends Misery Business and MCR, who never told us what he does for a living. Despite the nickname I've given him, he doesn't work in a cubicle, but rather at a hardware store, which happens to be filled with a lot of not so conventional weapons. If we take a look at the photo for these two, there are a couple of things to note. The picture is taken at the midway, and the lettering overhead says test your skill, but you'll notice that the letter S is kind of receded into the dark, and the result is just the word kill. These things that are pointed down at him are the same shape as the giant tricentennial sign that crushes him at the end of the movie. The photo also shows him holding a gun up to his girlfriend's face. He doesn't end up being the one to pull the trigger on her, but it is his nail gun that fires off and ultimately does her in, and she passes on while holding her hand up in the same pose that she does in the image. In the first movie, there were constant allusions to France, and more specifically, people who passed away in France. And Ian's mockery of the supposed death signals makes reference to that. How come when a guy dies of a plain heart attack, no one goes like, oh, wow, he was eating French toast when Princess Diana died in Paris, and then he saw her funeral on TV and now he's dead. Before I get on to the last two disaster scenes of the movie, I want to circle back to something I touched on earlier. Luck, chance, and fate. I've already gone over several examples of references to luck and characters having lucky charms, but there are actually even more that are associated with these three characters that make it to the end. Wendy's sister, Julie, has a bracelet given to her by her grandmother, and in one line, we learn that she actually considers it to be a good luck charm. You ran, so for me, some guys at that centennial thing, and I could really use my good luck. When she wakes up, she realizes that her sister is in danger, so she rushes to the tricentennial to try to save her. On the way, she crosses paths with Bloody hell, it's serious black! No, wait, it's just a wolf. But wolves are considered to be a symbol of good luck in Mongolian folklore. Then, at the festival, we see a blacksmith smelting an iron horseshoe, which, as I mentioned when I talked about FD2, is another good luck charm. Then, briefly skipping ahead to the final scene on the train, there's a poster for Discovery State Lottery, advertising a potential lucky payday, a scratch card lotto with the text, this could be your lucky day, and in Wendy's final vision, she breaks her leg. The phrase break a leg is another way of saying good luck. At the beginning of the tricentennial celebration scene, we're given a sort of quick recap of all of the disasters so far. We're shown a horseback rider to represent the riders of the roller coaster, a fiery grill to represent the burning girls in the tanning salon, we cut to Wendy hearing the song that played before Frankie's demise, we see some colonial men marching with swords to represent the swords that destroyed the weight machine that offed Lewis, and MCR shows up. It was his nail gun that took out Aaron. For some reason, he's acting like iDubs. Hey, I'm just celebrating our town's tricentennial. What a day. What a lovely day. Kevin chases off a couple of kids with sparklers in a scene very reminiscent of Clear at the gas station in Final Destination 2, and MCR suffers a fate that looked almost exactly like that of Tim Carpenter in that same movie. I just don't get why neither of them don't try to move. I guess he really just wanted to go headfirst for Halos. You know, he might have a bulletproof heart, but he most certainly does not have a signproof head. Like the FD1 finale in Paris, the subway scene would be the grand finale of Final Destination 3, and it holds more secrets than any other scene so far in the franchise. Five months after the main events of the movie, Wendy is in college, thinking that her, her sister, and Kevin are now safe from death's onslaught. Just as the opening took place on a roller coaster train, the finale would go down on a subway train. The advertisements plastered upon the walls and ceiling are looming reminders of the tragedies that befell Wendy's classmates just that summer. We see the slushy ad, the same forbidden drink that Ashley snuck into the tanning room, which ultimately dripped into the machinery, causing their disaster. Of course, I already mentioned the inclusion of the Phoenix Tanning Company. There's a promo for Build It. This is the hardware store where Misery Business was wasn't careful enough and uh, became a misguided ghost. Then there's one for Andy's, the fast food drive through where Frankie drove in, but not out. Then there's Montgomery and Glick. This one's actually a real company, and I wouldn't be surprised if this is the tax firm of choice for some of the crew, but the important part to note here is the slogan, there's no escaping death and taxes. The saying usually goes, there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes, so the no escape thing is a nice final destination twist on the old phrase. Another poster advertises a product called Cheesy Chums, which is made by Wolgamoth Fine Foods. That's a reference to Final Destination 3's art director, Tony Wolgamoth. There's also a new product called Blaze Unsweetened something. Perhaps another clue of the fiery crash that would soon occur. The one I find to be the most interesting though is the rail map. I noticed something was up when I heard this. Roll it. This is Booth Street. Next stop is on. End of the line. Next stop is the end of the line. 
Booth and Oswald are both assassins of American presidents. John Wilkes Booth is the guy who shot regular Abraham Lincoln, as Wendy explained earlier in the movie, and Lee Harvey Oswald is the man believed to have sniped John F. Kennedy. That got me thinking about the rail map here. We see a stop at Ruby Drive. Jack Ruby is the guy that killed Lee Harvey Oswald two days later in retaliation. The next stop is McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh was responsible for the Oklahoma City bombings in 1995. When he was arrested, he was wearing a t-shirt with a picture of Abraham Lincoln on it and the words Six Semper Tyrannus, allegedly the same words that John Wilkes Booth shouted in the Ford Theater before executing Lincoln. Then there's 63rd Street. John F. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. After that, there's Hiddell. Hiddell was the alias used by Lee Harvey Oswald when he bought the rifle used to fire upon John F. Kennedy. On the other side of the map, starting with the orange line, is another stop called Jim Jones. This was a cult leader who organized a major deadly crime in Jonestown, Guyana. One of the other stops is called the Jonestown Transfer. The next stop on the orange line looks like it says Hinky. This could be a misspelling of the surname of George Warren Hickey Jr., the Secret Service agent who was in the car behind John F. Kennedy the day he was shot. Some conspiracy theorists believe that Hickey Jr. is actually the one who took out Kennedy. The orange line ends at Hubbard. James Hubbard was a murderer from Alabama in the 70s. There are a couple of other stops on the other side of the orange line that are a little harder to make out. It looks like this one says Manchester, a reference to Trevor Hardy, an English killer who was nicknamed the Beast of Manchester, and this one looks like it says Berkowitz. That would be David Berkowitz, the man responsible for several shootings in 1976 in New York. Moving over to the green line, there's Bundy. That one's named after Ted Bundy, one of the biggest serial criminals in American history. I already mentioned Jonestown transfer, so next up is Cholgas. Now I have to admit, I thought this guy was pretty cool for having the letter CZ at the beginning of his name, but then I found out that he's not as cool as me, because Leon Cholgas was the assassin of American President William McKinley. That's when it all clicked for me, because when you watch Final Destination 3, one name that you'll hear over and over is McKinley. Their town is named McKinley, there's also a McKinley Street on the subway map, the theme park was McKinley Park, the school was McKinley High, and MCR's real name was Ian McKinley. With this in mind, I thought back to the first movie and started making even more connections. Mount Abraham, New York, and Mount Abraham High School were both probably named for Abraham Lincoln. Flight 180 also took off out of JFK Airport. The license plate of Carter's car had the letters RFK. That stands for Robert F. Kennedy, JFK's brother who was also assassinated. The next Green Line stop is Carcano, a reference to the type of rifle that Lee Harvey Oswald used. After that is Gein, Ed Gein, the butcher of Plainfield, Wisconsin. Applewhite. That's Marshall Applewhite another cult leader who did horrible stuff and claimed 39 lives. Finally, we have the red line, and that starts with Earl Way, a reference to James Earl Ray, the man who took out Martin Luther King Jr. Next stop, Korish, another cult leader. This one's from Texas. Really bad stuff, at least 20 victims. Next stop, Mombro. Francesca Mombro was an Italian bomber who took 96 victims in Rome in 1980. Next stop, Chapman. Mark David Chapman isn't just a banger of a mindless self-indulgence song, he was another assassin from Texas whose jealousy of the Beatles went too far, and he unfortunately ended the life of John Lennon. There are a lot of crazy theories about secret messages hidden in Beatles songs during the aftermath of this. I'm not going to get into it in this video, but I will just point out that Love Roller Coaster isn't the only song referenced by this movie with an urban legend behind it. As long as I'm on the topic of dead rock stars here, I'm just going to point out that Wendy has a bobblehead of Joey Ramone in her room, so maybe that also ties into this somehow. And my final thing that I'd like to point out is the end credits music. After the roller coaster crash, we heard the song Love Roller Coaster. And after the train crash to end the movie, the credits rolled accompanied by a cover of the song Love Train. If you're familiar with the song, you may know the original artist is the OJs, which gives us one more alleged killer reference, as OJ Simpson was suspected of taking out his wife in 1994. Click the video on the left for even more things you missed in the Final Destination franchise. Coming up next, I'll be covering movies 4 and 5, so make sure you don't miss it by subscribing to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell to select all notifications, and I'll see you in the next one, assuming we both survive. If you want to beat death, use a face mask and social distancing. Please!